I want to tell you about a new podcast called Amuse News. Publishing multiple days a week, Amuse News is your source for food news, interviews from around the food world, and more. On the show, we'll be engaging with food storytellers, from chefs to advocates to people working in the field, and many more. Find Amuse News wherever you get your podcasts. Amuse News is a destination for everyone who's looking for a new, insightful look into the world of food. Today's program has been brought to you by White Oak Pastures, a five-generation Georgia-based beef and poultry farm determined to conduct business in an honorable manner. For more information, visit whiteoakpastures.com. I'm Julia Tertian, host of Radio Cherry Bomb. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network, broadcasting live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. If you like this program, visit heritageradionetwork.org for thousands more. All right. Thanks so much for tuning in to the Heritage Radio Network. We're coming to you, as always, from the back of Roberta's Pizza in beautiful Bushwick, Brooklyn. You're listening to The Farm Report, and I'm your host, Erin Fairbanks. And I am particularly excited today to be joined in the studio by a very good friend, a mentor, leader, advocate for farmers everywhere, um, Patrick Martins. Thanks for having me, Erin. Well, Patrick... Am uh, I doing this? Is the mic too close? No, you're doing great. Okay. You're doing great. Um, Am I in the right chair? <laughs> so far, so good. Well, Patrick, as many of my listeners know, is the founder of Heritage Foods USA and Heritage Radio Network. And today we're going to be here talking about your brand new book, The Carnivore's Manifesto. Kudos. Thanks very much. I co-wrote it with a uh, co-host on the Heritage Radio Network, Mike Edison, who co-hosts the Mike and Judy show, which is now the Arts and Seizures show. So, Patrick, you know, you have been working in the sustainable food world for a number of years now. What prompted you to write the book? Why now? Well, uh, I had tried to write a book earlier, but um, A, I didn't have a great co-writer, and B, I wasn't, like, mature enough. I hadn't accumulated enough thoughts um, there are enough people out there that will write 400-page books about one topic, and they do that really well, uh, and they do it professionally. You know, they do research, there's statistics, they have a big uh, index with uh, all the studies that they're quoting from and facts and this and that. This book has a huge index, but not one of them is a statistic or something that a student would be able to use necessarily on a paper. But yet I do think it should be assigned reading because there are certain truths that don't need statistics like, uh, you know, that uh, industrial turkeys are treated inhumanely with the beak clipping and things like that. You don't need to get into stats. You just have to explain what's happening. And uh, too often statistics is, a, is like a world war. Nobody wins. You know, everyone has a different number for stuff. Well, yeah, you can make numbers say anything you want. Mm-hmm. So the format of the book is 50 short essays. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what do you think or what do you hope, I guess, this book will do for farmers? You're on the farm report here. Obviously, that's what we want to talk about. Like, what, what's the point? What's the goal? What's your greatest wish? Well, our greatest wish of the book is that more farms produce more of America's food. That is really across all 50 essays. Uh, you will notice each one basically has a roadmap in its, in its text for achieving Uh, a country that has more independent farms raising more food for more Americans. And, um, you know, at every meat conference I go to, they're like, uh, oh, let's talk about the meat issue. Uh, First question, should we eat meat? Is meat bad for the environment? Uh, Should we all be vegetarians? And I'm like, guys, this country ate 11 billion livestock. That, in fact, I think might be the only statistic in the book. Uh, 11 billion livestock a year in the United States. So we do eat meat. Let's start trying to embrace that and really push an alternative. We work together, Aaron, so I I always tell you, oftentimes the answer is to go opposite of what you're thinking, actually. So rather than try to get people to not eat meat, what about fiercely endorsing a good system and really pushing that and letting it grow and believing that it can grow? Well, I like chapter 27, build a slaughterhouse. You start with a quote from Frank Lloyd Wright. Regard it 
as just as desirable to build a chicken house as to build a cathedral. This is another one of those topics that comes up a lot in conversations around meat and, oh, we need more slaughterhouses. We, we need to do this. Why do you think that that's not happening? And, and what do you think some of the answers to that question are? I think it goes deep to the roots of vegetarianism in this country and PETA, you know, and their effect. It's basically a fear of covering certain issues. Uh, you know, investors, which of, what investor would have been drawn to opening a slaughterhouse, you know, and being in that world? It just wasn't sexy. It wasn't good. Now, all of a sudden, it's become good, but it takes a while for that to, uh, to, to change. Uh, Ted Turner, he's an exception. Ted's Montana Grill. And <laughs> remarkably, he has probably done more for sustainability and farming. One in nine bison live on his land. There's a chapter about Ted Turner in the book. I cannot think of one recognition in any way, shape, or form by any of the groups within the sustainable food world. And I track them through their magazines, publications, newsletters. Ted Turner, hello? He was the largest landowner, and he <laughs> preserved the land forever, and he has started a chain of bison so that their populations could increase. But, you know, they don't think that way. I think the sustainable food movement is still one that does not embrace pleasure and, like I say, actively engaging in an alternative. They still discuss whether meat is a reality versus let's open a slaughterhouse with $2 million. It'll be in the Bronx and farmers from everywhere can do it and we'll grind it up and make hamburger. It'll be sold in every coffee shop in New York. Simple thing. People done that with beer, with wine many years before that, but with meat, it's still not there because eh, that animal dying, it still, it still has an effect. Well, you work with um, a couple of different slaughterhouses uh, in different parts of the country. Can you give us a sense of what they're doing right and, and what, what you might point people to as far as uh, using them as an example for growing that movement of slaughterhouses? Well, I mean, there's not, they're doing stuff right just by having started it. There are not, not enough uh, slaughterhouses, basically. More people need to start it and, um, you know, Basically, that, that's what we would like to see. Uh, along with the farms, more farms, there's also got to be more slaughterhouses opening. Uh, you know, b attention to detail and consistency is the two biggest hallmarks of a good slaughterhouse and a good cryo machine, <laughs> which is remarkably something that many slaughterhouses do not invest in and think that they're going to grow. Well, kind of on that note, you have um, a little bit later in the book, uh, Chapter 47, your letter to a farmer... Uh, my letter to a farmer, I was actually most worried about this chapter because I did not want it to appear condescending. Really, I was just the vehicle for all these messages I'd learned from the farmers that I'd worked with. Well, so let's talk through some of those. Um, differentiate. You know, basically grow a new unique product. When it comes to meats, people don't understand that even, uh, I don't mean this as a slight against the local movement, but even local producers are still using commodity genetics. So they might be using a land rice pig that, you know, has 20 different breeds in it because it grows the fastest. And they're raising it correctly on their land, but it's important to differentiate like we do with heirloom seeds. People get that with heirloom seeds. The same exists for meat. So, But that goes for anything. Differentiate. Don't sell a commodity. Uh, quality includes customer service and delivery times. You know, well, we learned that ourselves, Erin. If uh, you recall, I, I'm sure you tried to put this out of your mind, but you used to make deliveries with me in an unrefrigerated U-Haul around the streets of New York and Brooklyn to deliver heritage breed, pasture-raised, antibiotic-free pig parts to restaurants all around the, the, the five boroughs. So we learned how angry a chef gets and how quickly they will cancel business with you if you cannot be consistent. So um, a lot of farmers, including ones we've worked with, uh, um, you know, end up feeling victims when in reality they just need to play the game. The game is payment, delivery, let me live my life and run my business, you should run yours, but we can't be tripping up on things all the time because then the whole system has to come to a halt to figure out credits, all that stuff. It's tough. Well, yeah, and I think that's like one of the things that, it, you know, in the in the quote-unquote like good food movement there is a tendency to uh, treat farmers as, as a population that we we need to help. We need to coddle. And I, I find that's paternalistic and, and condescending. 
don't don't ask for that, you know? Well, some do, you know, probably just I think they're encouraged to. We treat them like that. Charity events for them. No, we need to be helping them unite and be self self realized. You know, and and, and and consortium building. Um, you know, also I think the sustainable food movement is too nice. I have a chapter in here that says, "To hell with local, eat the best." Um, I've seen many people, you know, reward what I think might be third or fourth rate products just because it's local, just because they want to be nice. When in reality, I think the local farmer would benefit from a true, uh, a, a true reflection on what people might think if it's not really the best one, so that they can. Focus on what might be better. You know, they should be number one at what they do, not number four. And sometimes I think it's just unconditional liking uh, when it comes to that. Well, so, I mean, obviously we have different criteria when we look at purchasing our food. So is your is your kind of contention that we should strive for the best, but then how do we support people who are in transition? Um, well, the transition, I mean... You know, the one question to ask is the product climactically adapted to the spot. You know, if someone's trying to grow bananas in Poughkeepsie, I'd be like, dude, that's crazy. And maybe he thinks with global warming that it'll, uh, you know, pretty soon this will be the oranges and banana section of the world. But, you know, one is that in local agriculture should be encouraged. But if someone's trying to make a grating cheese in upstate, they should taste Parmigiano Reggiano. They should buy a big wheel in it and invest in it and eat it every day for a week because so many people regard that as the best grating cheese. So, you know, are you always holding yourself up to the best? Because if not, it's worth importing. And it just kind of complicates the buy local 100% of the time argument because sometimes that peach might just be so juicy from Georgia that it's the one worth seeking out. Well, that kind of reminds me of another chapter in the book where you're talking about sex cells, provocative mm-hmm. title. Um, to you know, they're looking at this idea that uh, of meat as a seasonal item. Mm-hmm. Uh, how, has that always been obvious to you? No, I learned it from you. What? <laughs> I did. Really? Goatober. <laughs> well, while we're on the topic of Goatober, I mean. So can you tell us a little bit about that conversation? No, you tell us. I learned it from you. Why would I talk about that when you're here? No, but I I feel like the the original conversation, as many kind of great things happened around a dinner table with you and your wife, Anne, who also did some really beautiful um, drawings for the book. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but some of those kind of initial questions and then how that, uh, the GOAT project kind of spilled over into other uh, livestock breeds. Mm-hmm. Well, no. I mean, can you just give the, the heads up on the GOAT project? Give us the four one-liners on it. All right. Well, so it was a conversation with you and your wife, Anne, mm-hmm. who rents a, a it cheese shop. It was really shop. you and Anne. I, I heard about it like two weeks later. Well, looking at um, at this rise of farmstead cheeses on uh, fine dining menus across the city, but not a corollary rise of goat meat. So kind of thinking, well, to get cheese, you need milk. And to get milk, you need to get pregnant and if these animals are getting pregnant which goats do once a year uh and they usually have twins uh half of those are male kind of what's happening to the male animals and how do we as responsible consumers need to be thinking about that um i'll just tell you where i started i was like well then just don't have babies and you're like well then how would cheese get made and i was like ah So that was a very big mind-opening thing, just that. And then, you know, we did our work together and realized that ducks, and I guess we always knew this, turkeys, ducks, geese, goat, uh, lamb, they're all seasonal. Salmon run but one time a year in Alaska. Every meat has its season. And uh, I think that because of artificial insemination and factory farming and the turkey sandwich being available at the deli 365 days a year, we are quick to forget that only pigs, cows, and chickens have sex all the time and give birth. Well, pigs, cows, and chickens, right? Yeah. And then most of the other ones are seasonal unless you do artificial insemination. So on top of everything, they these big corporations, they genetically engineer their animals to grow too fast. They confine them. They never let them see the day. And now you can add they don't let them have sex. You're like not getting to live out the very kind of features that make the animal what the animal is. Yeah, I mean, don't you want to get, I mean, you know, second, third base every now and then. They're just not allowed to do that, you know, and they're not allowed to to mate naturally. There's no sex on a farm. I mean, can you imagine that? That's not even a farm. 
Um, well, I want to um, take just a short break here. When we come back, I want to talk about the second chapter of your book, The $140 Turkey. Mm. So hang tight, folks. You're listening to The Farm Report. We are in studio with Patrick Martins, and we'll be right back. White Oak Pastures is the only farm in the United States that has its own USDA-inspected red meat abattoir or slaughterhouse and its own USDA-inspected poultry abattoir or slaughterhouse. We partner with Whole Foods to deliver our high-quality meat and poultry from Miami, Florida, all the way to Princeton, New Jersey. One family, one farm, five generations, 145 years. Full circle return to sustainable land stewardship, the humane animal stockmanship. For more information, please visit our website, whiteoakpastures.com. All right, we are back. You're tuned into the Farm Report on the Heritage Radio Network. And we are in studio with Patrick Martins talking about his new book, The Carnivore's Manifesto, just dropped this week. So definitely get it wherever fine books are sold. And I want to talk about but the not on Amazon. They're not fighting a- with Hatchet. Yeah, what, what's up with that? You know, uh, this guy Bezos is uh, in his efforts to kind of dominate the world, which, you know, we live in a capitalistic place. I mean, everyone should strive to be the best they can be and make the most money. But he's really bringing the publishing world to its knees. And I don't know, they've been around for two, three hundred years, and now they can't get paid enough for their books by the biggest bookseller. I mean, they say maybe 33% of all books are sold via Amazon. So when you take that away, uh, well, when that guy really tries to get your book that should be sold for $26 and they're selling it for seven, it it just makes it hard. I mean, maybe the days of books are over and everyone's going to be downloading it on their Kindle. But We'll be talking about rare breed books. We'll be like, ah, remember the time, the book, the hardcover, the softcover, the paperback. Kids will be like, the Bible was once printed? (laughs) Well, so probably the project for which, you know, in some ways maybe you're most well-known, the Heritage Turkey Project. Mm-hmm. $140 turkey, again, kind of coming back to a lot of flack that the, the um, good food, mi- food movement gets. Why should we be paying $140 for a turkey? Um, well, I mean, that's a why should we? I mean, uh, that includes FedEx and stuff like that. Uh, well, I mean, I, I was actually on this uh, very sitting right over there talking to Dave Arnold about this. So, um There's this elitist argument, uh, you know, that that gets thrown against the sustainable food world. And I think that it's actually backwards. Everybody who thinks they're being democratic and good by arguing for cheap food, when it comes to meat anyway, because that's all I'm talking about, just meat, carnivores manifesto. I'm not trying to get into fruits and vegetables and all that. I think people need to eat. But should they be eating less meat? That's the question. So we live in a society where people are like, $140 turkey, that's wrong. It's too expensive. Most Americans can't afford it. So it's not the correct turkey to be promoting. We also have to promote the very uh, the other turkeys, you know, that cost 99 cents. And that's wrong because, uh, you know, and this will be explained in the book, I mean, they do all those things I said earlier. They de-beak the turkey, so turkeys are naturally picky eaters. They cannot, uh, you know, uh, they usually pick and choose what they want, but when they de-beak them, they're basically, their faces turn into a shovel, basically, and they are just putting all this mush, this antibiotic-ridden mush into their bodies, and they keep the lights on all day so that they are constantly eating. They are unhealthy. They grow really, really big. Um, way bigger than their bodies can sustain. Uh, they never see the light of day. Oftentimes, these big companies dump the animal waste into rivers and lagoons that explode. They're not held to the same standards as cities are. Uh, they have to give antibiotics to these animals just to survive their short lives, and people are consuming that. That's bad for them. They're getting resistant to medicine. Why are we arguing for that turkey? That's not right. Right. You should not be telling anybody that they should, whether they can afford it or not, is not the issue. No one should be promoting the consumption of that turkey. And, of course, this is realistic. We have three chapters in this. I eat bacon, egg, and cheeses all the time. That bacon comes from a cruel system. This is not a utopic society book. It's about a slow turning of the wheel and getting away 
from this thing that actually secretly shields the robber barons. It shields these big companies because they can say our chicken is cheap. That's not right anymore. You know, they've they've violated enough rules with how they treat agriculture that, um, you know, we have to start saying what is the true cost. That's not the real cost, and nobody should be told to eat unhealthy food. Just like no one should open liquor stores in bad neighborhoods, you know, all these liquor stores. It's the same concept. So, well, let's talk a little bit about what um, makes the turkeys that you work with so special. And in particular, I think it's it's the producer who grows them and, and the genetics. How did that relationship come about? Well, I met Frank Reese through Slow Food. The ARC committee of Slow Food uh, basically boarded the turkey, the heritage turkeys, like four breeds in Narragansett, the Jersey Buff, uh, the Standard Bronze, and and the black turkey, I think, onto the Ark of Taste. And I knew that the Ark had no teeth, that we needed to actually do something to give it teeth. So we started, uh, so if we call it a presidium at the time, it's like the Latin word for garrison. And uh, we tried to sell a thousand turkeys from a farmer who raised them just for us. And he was Frank Reese and considered the foremost expert on poultry in America. And, um, you know, he didn't have the efficiency of scale. You know, he couldn't fill up a slaughterhouse for a day, but he pushed through. And, uh, you know, we paid him. Those first few years were tough. But it's uh, 12 years now, uh, 11 years, and we have a great relationship. And he raises turkeys for us still and might be turning his farm into a kind of B&B university where people can learn all about poultry. Um. One of the things that I feel like inspired uh, the Turkey Project was, you know, Carlo P- Petrini saying that, like, the best way to support a farmer is to buy from them. Um, so what way do should we be looking or thinking about doing that? I mean, you talk a little bit about merchants in the book and, like, how we as uh, consumers can kind of self-evaluate our impact. Mm-hmm. Can you share a little bit of that with us? I would just say it's one rule. Um If you uh, don't shop at five different stores for your food, you're probably not doing it right. So what do you mean? You know, uh, if you're going to one store, and I will not mention it, just God forbid they're sponsors. If you're only going to one store and you're picking up your meat, your bread, your cheese, your olive oil, and even your beer, you're probably not doing it right. You have to go to five, I think, stores is the number we picked for the book. Five stores regularly, every couple of weeks. And uh, Fresh Direct, uh, that's a no-no. I know they're not sponsors. You can do it sometimes when you need it, but conversation withers on the vine if you do not go and stand in line at the store and engage your local merchants. I mean, think about buying cheese at Ann's shop versus, uh, you know, a supermarket. We're going and pulling like a saran wrap piece of cheese off a shelf where there's a sign doing uh-huh. the work, not a person. And there's not, uh, yeah, there's not the same person there even when you do have a question. Well, and I think too, that kind of leads us into another of my favorite chapters in the book where you talk about this word, which I, you invented, tetwar. Um, can you tell us what is tetwar? It, tetwar is, you know, terroir is the land speaking to the food, and it's the influence that the land has on the food. So I invented the, you know, the, obviously uh, grapes in Napa Valley, for instance, or lentils in Puy, France. Uh, champagne started because it wasn't a good terroir for grapes, so they had to do something with it, and uh, they had tetoir. Tetoir is the French word for tet is the French for head. So what terroir is to the land, tetoir is to the mind, and tetoir builds when one creative person passes on skills to an apprentice, and sometimes there's so many of these skills in a place that the locus itself becomes tetoir. Like, uh, you know, an example of Tetwar, like Portland, Oregon, or, you know, Brooklyn for writers. And, um, yeah, it's basically creative uh, corporate knowledge in a way. Well, I want to... That's what the San Antonio Spurs call it. Creative Uh, corporate knowledge? They they call it corporate knowledge. That's what uh, Popovich says to his team, those guys. It's about corporate knowledge. She's talking about Tetwar. Well, I want to think, talk a little bit about the Tetwar of... Our, our block here in Bushwick. I mean, I think mm. that's like one of those things people are used to hearing me talk about, uh, you know, the studio and being here in Roberta's. But, you know, you were here really at the beginning of Roberta's, the beginning of radio. Uh, what was the kind of like ethos and tetware of the space then? And how has it remained the same or changed? Well, um, Jack will remember uh, when uh, Roberta's was very, very early. All it was was just Roberta's really. Uh, now just starting from the corner uh, of my block 
well, I guess the last business is still a big empty lot there. It is still Bushwick, but there are um, carpenters that build big, beautiful restaurants and bars. Then there's Heritage Foods and the radio office. Then there's an apart- a little apartment building. Then there's a chocolate maker who also makes coffee. Espresso is very good. I know you don't like his coffee. He makes tons of great chocolates. Then there's a deli, which whatever. But then there's Swallow, which is makes great bagels. And actually, that was there. And uh, then you have a great restaurant, Momo Sushi Shack, which is really about to double in size and just is a great place if Roberta's is full or vice versa. Um, you know, come to Roberta's. And then right around the corner from them is a wine shop and then Roberta's. So all of a sudden, this has become a little broad way of, of artisan. I don't want to say hipster because that's word is thrown about a lot. Although, you know, I think they're bringing something new to food for sure. What what are hipsters bringing to food? I guess they're serving great food without the white tablecloth. Or they're selling great wine and they're selecting, they're mongering for the best cheeses or wines, but without the, you know, being in a suit uh, or a uniform. Um, you know, you can go to a food truck now and eat food as if you were at Jean-Georges. At I, least a dish. At least a dish. No, I mean, I'm like a, I would agree with you for like a bite or two. You know, yeah, you'd, a have pork some, bun. you'd have some delicious bites. Yeah, yeah. yeah you wouldn't have the, the service and all sure, that, yeah. but they can now achieve that level by you know prepping it in advance so that when the person orders it, they're just firing it. All the effort went in before. I mean, charcuterie is the same thing. You know, um, it only takes a second to eat. <laughs> Uh, I want to, well, I want to wrap up. We're just about out of time, but I want to wrap up with chapter 37, <gasps> probably one of my favorite chapters in in the book. And, and I'm wondering, 37. you know, if I could oh. possibly, you know, convince you to do a little bit of a, a, a reading from this chapter for us. We demand that the president of the United States, with the full support of the U.S. Congress, declare National Farmers Day to celebrate the people responsible for our agriculture. Past present, and future. We propose that Farmer's Day should occur on August 1, the beginning of the slowest in spirit month of the year. It will be a day for farmers to come to the city and for city dwellers to travel to the farm, all in an effort to connect Americans with the heroes behind our food supply. Every culture we can think of has a harvest day except America, and no, Thanksgiving, our national day of quasi-religious thanks, does not count. National Farmers Day will be a chance to taste new food and get closer to the earth. Most importantly, it is for children who should learn where their food comes from and enjoy a curiosity and respect for what they eat. But to rebuild our food culture and guarantee that our children will grow up embracing healthy, natural food, we'll have to be vigilant to keep the industrial food complex from co-opting the event as publicity for corporate agriculture. Know this, Aaron that they will come in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are as ravening wolves. We are a nation raised on the backs of our farmers, and National Farmers Day, NFD, will will celebrate the traditions of our very best foods while promoting a healthy future secured by American independent farmers, the hardest working people in the world. Patrick, thank you so much for joining us today. It was really great having you in the studio. Thank you for uh, inviting me. Again, the book is The Carnivore's Manifesto, Eating Well, Eating Responsibly, and Eating Meat by Patrick Martins with Mike Edison. Uh, Head on over to barnesandnoble.com to order a copy today. Not Amazon, unfortunately. (laughs) They're at war with Hatchet. Or come visit us here in Bushwick. We would love to um, sell you a book and get you a signed copy, maybe share a slice. Thanks so much again for tuning in. This has been another episode of The Farm Report. This show, like all 35 of our live weekly programs, can be found for free by visiting our website, www.heritageradionetwork.org. You can also find us on Stitcher Smart Radio and via iTunes. Thanks so much for listening and stay tuned in. Thanks for listening to this program on heritageradionetwork.org. You can find all of our archived programs on our website or as podcasts in the iTunes store by searching Heritage Radio Network. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Heritage underscore Radio. You can email us questions at any time at info at heritageradionetwork.org. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization. To donate and become a member, visit our website today. Thanks for listening.
Hey listeners, we're nearing the end of our 15th anniversary fundraising campaign, and we need your help to meet our goal. This campaign offers you a chance to win a unique food and music experience in one of the most exciting cities in America. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and you'll be entered to win dinner for two and two tickets to a concert in one of eight amazing cities. New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Ardmore, Pennsylvania, and Asheville. All donations support our work educating food system storytellers. And when you donate... You can choose one of those cities and you'll be entered to win dinner and two tickets to a show. So help us reach our goal and enter to win dinner and a show in the city of your choice. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you.